In this edition of Art Rocks, an artist's home that's a skillful mix of colour and collections. I'm very fond of red and um, I always seem to paint at least one room in every house red. Gaze at giant glass sculptures. The colours are so vibrant, there's no other artist in glass that's doing what Dale Chihuly is doing. A musician takes us on an emotional journey. I think that it was a pretty sad reason to switch, however, it was an uh, absolute blessing. And the sounds of an orchestra surround us. This is a labor of love for everyone on stage, and the more excited the students are, the happier we are. It's all ahead on this edition of Art Rocks. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello, I'm James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads Magazine, and this is Art Rocks. Each week, we'll feature an artist, musician, or writer from Louisiana, along with a look at some creative folks working in communities across the country. In our first segment, we'll meet artist Hunt Slonem who's penchant for collecting ranges from birds to gothic chairs. Sloanham frequently leaves his studio in New York behind to rest and rejuvenate in his grand South Louisiana home. Let's take a look. Having traveled extensively throughout his life, artist Hunt Sloanham might have chosen a second home in any number of exotic locales. His connections to Louisiana led him to the tranquil countryside along Bayou Teche. My grandfather painted, so it was an early childhood decision that that's all that I wanted to do. And at Tulane University, I um, was fortunate enough to take Louisiana architecture with Sam Wilson, and we did tours of plantation homes. And I used to dream about plantations as a child, actually. After graduating from Tulane, Slona moved to New York City to set up his studio. But even early in his career, he had shows often in New Orleans galleries. So I had had a relationship with Louisiana, and I always thought I'd wind up with something in New Orleans uh, to call home at some point in my life. When a psychic predicted he'd own a plantation home, he wasn't seeing that in his future. But in 2004, he received a sudden windfall when a single client purchased the bulk of his work as it was being unloaded to a New Orleans gallery. Days later, he was invited to visit Albania Plantation in Generet. The owner of the home for the last 40 years, Miss Emily Sear, had passed away, and the property was for sale. I feel that houses kind of pick people, especially houses with pasts like this one. You know, it was built by the Gravenberg family in probably 1837, and then Isaac Delgado acquired it after the Civil War, and um, the new, you know formed the Albania Trust at his death, which um, still exists and. A lot of that money paid for the New Orleans Museum, original building, which was originally called the Delgado Museum, and Delgado University. And uh, the sugarcane crop was not part of Miss Emily's purchase. She acquired the house in 10 acres. And when I got it, it was in pretty rough shape. We had plaster falling and holes in ceilings. And, you know, structurally it was solid, but I had to rewire it. And gosh, we had to replaster and just endless projects. Some unexpected help came in the form of the movie industry. All the King's men had scouted the house before I bought it. And they filmed here for two months with Jude Law and Kate Winslet was very good for me. It would help the money from that help me paint and restore the outside of the house. Besides the restoration and upkeep of Albania, Slonim also tackled its decoration. Fortunately, his penchant for collecting has provided the plantation home with a sumptuous decor. The house I bought with only one bed and a piece of wicker furniture. <laughs> so I have had to um, find everything that's in the house. I have a great love for 19th century 
uh, things. I find wonderful old Paris pieces all the time and just can't get enough, it seems, of, um, of a new interest in porcelains. And I've gotten a lot of portraits for the house and things that would have been perhaps here in some period of its history. The bold and masterful use of color is a gift the artist has put to use, from the vibrant tangerine in the parlor to the hypnotic periwinkle of a bedroom setting. I'm very fond of red, and um, I always seem to paint at least one room in every house red, and I just think things look so fantastic against a, a colored wall. In fact, David Hockney, the painter, once said that when you hang something on a white wall, your eyes go to the edge of a painting, and when you hang something on a colored, a color wall, that your eyes go to the center of the painting. And I've noticed that a lot of museums are now starting to use color. Among the historic portraits and classical sculpture, Slonim's own paintings add a spark of interest. I like to, you know, breathe vibrancy into these houses. With all the work this home entails, it remains primarily a place of respite for the artist, where a break from the studio restores the spirit. In his artwork, Slonim has examined numerous themes, his ongoing investigation of the meaning of spirit fueling paintings of saints and Hindu gods, his fascination with mysticism and channeled messages released in portraits of legendary figures, and his love of the natural world, the tree of life, celebrates the spirit in plant and animal form. I had lived with a 40-foot cage of birds behind where I paint, for 24 years in my studio in New York, and I suddenly realized that I was looking at the world through the grid, which took on all these meanings for me about the last look at nature, you know, the deforestation of rainforests. Um, so I paint wet into wet, and I've been doing cross-hatching marks. After I've painted the whole painting, I take the back of the brush and I whittle it to a point, and I make all these little marks by hand to sort of dissolve the image and create an interesting surface. I have continued to do that, not just with nature paintings, but even portraits, particularly if the person isn't living. You know, new themes enter my work or develop. The rabbits have gotten very prolific in my <laughs> production. I, I'd like to use these early, you know, 19th century photo portrait frames to frame them and hang them in groups of 100. Slonim's status as a part-time Louisiana resident became evident in the series of paintings he created with a bayou landscape as the dominant theme. These nine by nine foot square canvases were all painted in Slonim's New York studio. In them, he captures the bayou in every season and expresses the changing color of the light in these slow moving waters. Hunt Slonim treasures the contemplative life he enjoys at Albania Plantation where watching time go by is a pleasure with purpose, refreshing the spirit. Hunt Slonim's work is shown internationally and his lavishly decorated homes have been documented in many books. For more information, visit HuntSlonim.com. Now let's take a look at some arts and cultural events taking place throughout Louisiana. For more information on these events, visit our website at lpb.org slash art rocks. And you can find more arts events like these at countryroadsmag.com. Dale Chihuly has taken the ancient Italian art form of glass blowing and transformed it into a large scale sculpture practice. We enter this brightly colored world at the Phoenix Desert Botanical Garden and learn how cacti and art connect. It's called the Sapphire Star. More than 700 blue to clear spires begin the Chihuly in the garden exhibit. The colors are so vibrant. There's no other artist in glass that's doing what Dale Chihuly is doing. What he's doing in Phoenix is generating oohs, ahs, and questions. Well, what's, a, what's a beluga? I guess they kind of look like whales. 
So do you think it's like this big like fish hook? Each piece, from the chandelier to the scarlet and yellow icicle tower, is created by a team of glass blowers with final approval coming from Dale Chihuly. He uh, is probably the most successful um, artist to exhibit in gardens around the world. Um, but there is nowhere that he can, has exhibited where he has our plant collection, the beautiful light that the desert has, and then the wonderful vistas and backdrops. It's just a different space for him to see his work. And that's why McGinn says Phoenix is the only garden to host two Chihuly exhibits. The first was in 2008. And we had um, over half a million people visit the garden in six months, which was a record for us. This exhibit features 21 installations spread across 55 acres. Chihuly's signature in every show that I've ever seen, whether it's a fine art museum or a garden, is a boat. Um, he's a collector of boats. And he collects many, many things, but one of the things he's an avid collector of are these um, antique wooden boats. This boat was actually a tender. Um, it dates back to the 1800s, so they're quite fragile when they come. Um, and he loves to put what he calls the millefiori, which is just this wonderful showcase of uh, different shapes and colors of glass into the boat. For more than a year, Chihuly and his team worked with garden staff to pick the best spots. Moving the artwork from Chihuly's studio in Seattle to a canvas in the desert took patience. The glass came in six tractor trailer trucks over the course of three days. Um, they come in hundreds of boxes and each box contains um, pieces of each of the installations. Uh, Chihuly sends a team of 12 down to help us through the installation. They actually do the physical um, installation itself and it took us about two weeks to get it all installed. The Sun was the largest installation. It, it, had, it took the longest to install, about three and a half days. It took a team of five Chihuly installers and it has 2,000 pieces of glass. Some colors and shapes are so striking you can't miss them, like these yellow herons. They're very graceful and they're sitting in the herb among herbs. So as you're standing and looking at the, the piece, you're also smelling lavender and thyme. There's um, a, a chocolate flower. So it's just this wonderful sense, ex sensory experience. Other pieces blend in so well, you might mistake them for desert plants. You could stand here for 10 minutes and watch people go walk right by it. But when the sun goes down, McKinn says every piece becomes a star. At night, it's a completely different show. All the sculptures are lit, and we have going up the Garden Butte, we have um, 26 neon panels, so the garden is just glowing at night. Keeping all this glass shiny requires the white glove treatment. It takes about 10 hours each week. The best thing I hear a lot is, wow, look at that. I really love that. Um, but for us, you know, we, we are about being the garden. And to have visitors come in and they'll say, wow, look at that. And then they'll go, and look at that plant. You know, that is really cool. Or I hear often just walking around, um, you know, I, I didn't know this place was here or I didn't know how beautiful the desert could be. To learn more, visit chihuly.com. In this segment, let's meet classical musician Miles Harlan. Harlan has overcome many struggles, from bullying to financial troubles, but he found a way to thrive through the power of music. When I perform, um, it's always the same feeling. You know, you get the butterflies in the stomach, and that just really shows that you care about what you're doing. You want to perform the best. Um, when I perform, I put a very, very high expectation on myself, and it really helps me, it drives me. When I was younger, I got into music by listening to many artists who I loved, like my mom always played different CDs by like Aretha Franklin and Miles Davis, which is who I was named after, and she loved him, and James Brown, and you know, we heard some things from Destiny's Child and Beyonce around the house. Miles always was a musical kid. He liked dancing, singing, beating drums, anything. And then all of a sudden, 
when he got to elementary school, he picked up the flute. And then he picked up the flute, and they were like, he's really good. He taught himself how to play. Well, he got teased for playing the flute. <laughs> so he wanted to change, and he's like, I'm going to play that. Well, that happened to be the oboe. I think that it was a pretty sad reason to switch. However, it was an uh, absolute blessing, I believe. At first, what stood out about Miles as a uh, young man, as a seventh grader, was that uh, he was very shy. Uh, we kind of referred to him as a, a wounded bird because he couldn't look up at you. And, but he was so eager and so enthusiastic um, that that's what stood out more than anything else, besides the fact that he was, he was talented. Um, but he had experienced some trouble at schools, bullied a little bit, and so uh, a couple members of my faculty and I recognized this and said we need to kind of do intervene here and see what we can do about uh, helping this kid out by helping him to focus on, on his music and also to help build his confidence. It's truly a blessing. These people didn't know us. <laughs> I didn't come out and say, hey, where do I, you know, the flag, we need help. They just gravitated and saw our story. We're pretty private. You know, we just get by on what we can. And these people believed in the arts, believed in Miles, wanted him to know that everybody in the world isn't, <laughs> you know, mean, and it could be better, and you can do what you love and be happy, and it changed his life. I mean, it really changed his life. I see the oboe for Miles as being his voice. Uh, when he couldn't express himself, uh, he put all of that energy into practicing. Uh, my, my mom actually bought him uh, his first oboe. My school district wasn't supportive and the oboes that they had were not adequate and I would purposely get broken oboes and oboes with all these problems and they were never the best. And so she sent me like seven oboes to me and my oboe teacher at the time. And she said, just pick one. And so when I picked the one that I really wanted, it just felt amazing. Cause it was also like a, like the leash was being cut. I no longer had to go through all of the abuse really. He uh, had, was practicing so much that he fell asleep one night and then fell and actually broke it in half <laughs> because he just spent so much time, it was as if it were his best friend. My mom told me that when I perform, it's always about the passion of playing the oboe, so I try to get really in the mindset of the piece, which means that sometimes when I perform, I may come to the oboe very sad if I'm playing a piece about, you know, they're so crazy with operatic oboe solos. I mean, someone's wife could have died or, you know, and when you really get into that character, the way the audience sees it can be really great if you really dive into it and become passionate about what you're doing. The first time I heard him play really, really with his heart into it was a solo ensemble festival, and he got a one on his first solo. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing. And he played this really great piece <laughs> and it was so moving. And then I wouldn't look at him because he was like, don't look at me, you make me nervous. So I sat behind him and they were recording it. And I'm like, that's amazing. Throughout my life, I have had so many ups and downs and it's a story in itself. So I can take those emotions that I take from other places and for instance, if I'm playing a very sad, um, melancholy piece, my mother and I, um, when I was nine years old, we lost our home. And although I was not very sad about the, the incident or the event, I was more sad, shockingly I guess, of how my mom looked during that moment and when she was crying. And I, I can try to find that same emotion. Whether if the audience feels sad after performance or whether if they're happy or mad. I know that I've done my job because I have connected with them and changed their emotions on something in some kind of way. Miles is more like the lotus, growing out of mud and then blossoming. 
I know that he's happy. There was a time when I could honestly sit and say that I'm not sure that he was happy. His oboe was like his security blanket. He, it was where he went to, that place he went to when things were bad. And now he loves it. He got a scholarship to Interlochen. Um, he won the Artistic Excellence Scholarship. Got a scholarship to college. <laughs> the oboe has allowed me to have great friends, great mentors, and it really has allowed a great impact on me and it has totally shaped my, my life, my, what I plan to do. It was really a new route that I had not expected to take and it has allowed a great, great life for me and it has really prepared a great life for me. Um, going to Interlochen Arts Academy as being an alumni from that is really amazing. And it has also gotten me into Vanderbilt University, the same school that James Patterson went to is amazing. And being in Nashville, Tennessee, it's, it's all too good to be true, really. Each week on Art Rocks, we'll celebrate and learn about Louisiana's treasures, one of those artistic or cultural elements that have a unique connection to Louisiana. This week, we turn a street corner and magically leave the pace of city life behind. Let's travel back in time at the Rural Life Museum. A magnificent gift was made to Louisiana State University and the growing city of Baton Rouge when the Burden family left their 440-acre family farm to the university. It was the largest single gift ever given to LSU, but it came with some stipulations. The land was to be used for the Ag Center's research as a green space for the city and to house a rural life museum. Steel Burden had already begun to collect artifacts from the 19th century, machinery, tools, and other items used in farming cotton or sugarcane as well as the artwork and crafts that represented the working classes. And there were buildings, authentic structures donated by families across the state and moved to the site. A dog trot house from the 1860s, the former College Grove Baptist Church, and slave cabins from the Wellham Plantation. Over nearly 45 years, the Rural Life Museum has collected an amazing compilation that represents the lives and work of the common man. How do you inspire young musicians? In Orlando, Florida, elementary schools team up with the city's orchestra to give students a taste of classical music with a twist. Here's the story. Young People's Concerts presented by the Orlando Philharmonic have been in place for over 20 years. For many of these students, this is the first time that they ever see a live orchestra. This is a great project and program because we get to take our second, third, fourth, and fifth graders uh, between this and the ballet series that we do, and we expose kids to symphonic orchestral music uh, through live performances. So instead of them just getting to see it on YouTube or some web-based application, they actually get to experience the symphony orchestra live and hopefully um, be so excited about what they experience, want to continue to see and be a patron of the orchestra and orchestral music throughout their lives. We study music in elementary school and in any grade level Orchestral music is a big part of uh, the history of music, obviously, and this is just an amazing way for them to be able to take what they're learning in class and move it out into the community and again to really experience live music and live musicians. For many students at this age, stories are what really tie the music to them personally. They love hearing stories, they love understanding the story, they love knowing what the music is about so that they have something to hold on to so that when students attend in grades three through five, by the end they have a well-rounded musical experience. 
The uh, Orange County Public Schools worked closely with United Arts of Central Florida to come up with this project. There were other models around the country um, of this happening and we knew that our kids deserved this and needed these kind of experiences and Orange County Public Schools made a commitment to fund this so there's really no expense to the school. This is a labor of love for everyone on stage and the more excited the students are, the happier we are. I always love being outside at the end of the concert um, and ask the kids what did you think and they just go on and on and on. I mean, their teacher's trying to get them and move them to the bus but they can't uh, wait to tell you everything that they learned and heard and what their favorite song was and favorite instrument and they just glow I and mean, they leave that auditorium and they're glowing with excitement because again, I think the key is that they learned about these things in their classroom by their music teacher and then they also got to come here and experience it for real. I mean, that's an amazing experience for anybody, not to mention these young kids. To learn more about the program, visit orlandophil.org. And that wraps it up for this edition of Art Rocks. Of course, you can always visit us online at lpb.org slash artrocks, where you'll find feature videos and information on upcoming arts events. So until next time, I'm James Fox Smith from Country Roads Magazine, and thanks for watching. <laughs>